So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms publications, online resources, EIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or a teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget. Or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nalulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. 
Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mababatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! BIDS. For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DBRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget. Or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at pulisiya 
para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PIDS webinar series where we tackle development issues based on data and evidence. We trust that all of you are safe and in good health. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. Friends, so for this afternoon's webinar, we will look at two things. First, how the national government is assisting local government units in performing very devolved functions. And second, we will look at the current structure of water service delivery at the local level, assessing the role of the national government and the private sector, 
the mandates of the different regulatory bodies and issues in regulation, technical and raising and cooperation. Officially open our event, I now give the floor to the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes. Mamsel? Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following Department of Finance Assistant Secretary Soledad Cruz, Bureau of Internal Revenue Deputy Commissioner Celia King, Department of Budget and Management OIC Director Nympha Manalastas and Regional Director Ricky Sanchez, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director General Romulo Emanuel Miral Jr., National Economic and Development Authority Cordillera Administrative Regional Director Stephanie Christensen, and NED Assistant Regional Director Dolores Malintas. We also have from Banco Central and Pilipinas Director Siti Butokan and Managing Director Zeno Ronald Abenoja. Um, the Tourism OIC Director Andrada, Water District General Manager Paulino Cunanan, Butuan City Water District General Manager Anselmo Sanctian, Metropolitan Tukigara Water District General Manager Miller Tangilan, Santa Cruz Water District General Manager Lerma Elma Marcelo, Legaspi City Water District General Manager James Esplana, Sorala Water District General Manager Antonio Canyeso, Tandag Water District General Manager Eulogio Maria, Pacific Water and Wastewater Association President Vicente Hoyas, Cooperative Development Authority Executive Director Ray Elavaso, and from the private sector, we have iMetrics Asia Pacific Corporation President Nick Fontanilla, Manila Water Chief Operating Officer Perry Rivera, and Vice President Jeffrey Gatdula, Development Alternatives Incorporated Chief of Party Alma Porciuncula, Cargill Philippines Corporate Affairs Director Christopher Ilagan. And from the academe, we're joined this afternoon by Cross of College President for Academic Affairs Teresa Fabiana. Center for Policy Studies and Advocacy and Sustainable Development Executive Director Maria Fatima Liena and University of Asia and the Pacific Director Joey Dacna. Also have this afternoon ECODEV Vice President Minerva Morales, Ivan Foundation Executive Director Sony Africa, Water.org Interim Executive Director Sajid Amit, Universities and Councils Network on, Inno on Innovation for Inclusive Development for Southeast Asia. President Segundo Joaquin Romero Jr. and Masaganang Sakakan Director Daniel Agustin. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our third webinar this April. Today we will be hearing the presentation of PIDS Research Fellow Dr. Justin Sikat and University of the Philippines Assistant Professor Lawrence Velasco on two PIDS studies, namely Philippine Local Government Public Expenditure Review, a survey of national government local governments for programs, and the Philippine Local Government Water Sector. The first study, which will be presented by Dr. Sikat, examined the of national government programs that were provided to local governments to help them deliver the basic infrastructure services in the past decade. Among these were the Department of Public Works and Highways Local Infrastructure Program, Department of Agriculture's Farm to Market Road Programs, and the Department of the Interior and Local Government's Financial Subsidy to Local Government Units. In a previous study, Dr. Kat and her team mentioned assessing the government budget utilization rate to see if appropriated public funds are spent in a timely manner. They noted that this has implications on the implementation implementation of programs, projects, and activities, and consequently on keeping track with development plans and targets. For local governments, what is being monitored is the utilization of their local development funds, which for every calendar year should be at least 20% of their internal revenue allotment or ERA. The earlier studies showed that there was a low utilization of the LDF because of poor planning, monitoring, and prioritization in the gas rates. It is important to understand and address similar issues in local spending in light of the implementation of the Mandana's ruling 
which supports the increase of local government units uh, era based. According to the Sim Supreme Court, the source of LGUs era should come from all national taxes and not just from internal revenue taxes, which is the current practice in the country. Based on the estimates of the DCC or the Budget Coordination Committee, LGU's 2022 era sourced from the 2019 collections of the Bureau of Internal Revenue and Bureau of Custom would increase significantly. This means a budget for governments to finance their programs and projects in the years to come. Meanwhile, the study, which will be presented by Mr. Velasco, looked into the current structure of water service delivery at the local level and the mandate of local governments in the provision of water supply, the role of government and the private sector in the service delivery area. Targets in water supply provision are geared toward the achievement of the current Philippine Development Plan, Philippine Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan, and the sustainable development set by the UN, particularly goal number six, which aims to ensure access to water and sanitation for all. Based on the cities and municipalities competitiveness index, there was an average annual increase of 2.4% from 2011 to 2016 in terms of households with water service, which is good news. According to the index, the national capital region has the highest percentage of households with water service, while ARM has the lowest. However, there are still major issues that need to be resolved. Based on the Philippine Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan, more than 12 million people still access water from unsafe sources, and there are still some areas without water service providers. Also, the same document cites NEDA's report in 2019 that says there has been evidence that 31% of water districts in the country have failed to operate. Citing National Water Resources Board's list in 2017, the second study noted that Region 9, Asambuanga Peninsula, and Soxargen have the lowest proportion of population served by the service providers at 11% and 15.8% respectively, while Western Visayas has the highest number of waterless municipalities. The COVID-19 pandemic has also aggravated the situation. The crisis has shown us the importance of sanitation, hygiene, and adequate access to clean water for preventing and containing the spread of the virus. Medical experts and organizations recommend frequent hand washing to reduce the spread of pathogens and prevent infections. In the Philippines, however, there are still, one, there are still many households with no access to safe water. To better understand these issues, Mr. Velasco's presentation this afternoon will tackle some regulatory overlaps and investment coordination gaps which can affect the efficient delivery of water service in the country. We've also invited discussants to help us gain more insights about the topics to be presented. We're honored to have with us Ms. Elvira De Leon, Manager of the Local Water Utilities Administration's Corporate Planning Division, and Engineer Carlos Santos, the General Manager of Santa Maria Water District, and the Indigenous Past President of the Philippine Association of Water District. We thank both of you for accepting our invitation, and we look forward to hearing your comments. There's so much to learn and talk about this afternoon, so I'd like to encourage all of you to stay until the end and actively participate in the open forum later. Once again, let me thank you for being with us today. I now give back the floor to Sheila. Thank you very much, Mamsel, for setting the tone of our webinar this afternoon and for giving us uh, key facts and figures related to the two studies. Um, as mentioned by Dr. Celia, we have uh, two studies to be presented today and flashed on the screen are the authors. The first study titled Philippine Local uh, Government Public Expenditure Review, a survey of national government local, national government local government support programs was authored by Dr. Justin Seacott, Angel Fe Castillo, and Rick C. Madawin. While the second study titled uh, the Philippine Water Sector government water sector was uh, written by Mr. Uh, Lawrence Velasco and Dr. Sikat with assistance from um, Ms. Castillo and Ms. Madawin. The presentations today will be delivered by the uh, main authors of the papers, uh, namely Dr. Sikat and Mr. Velasco. Dr. Sikat is an assistant professor at the uh, Cesar Virata School of Business, University of the Philippines, Liman and she is on secondment at TIDS as a research fellow. 
Her academic and professional experience is focused on public sector economics and political economy. She has a PhD in business administration, PhD in economics candidacy, and a master's degree in management and in economics all from UP Diliman. Meanwhile, Mr. Lawrence Velasco is an assistant professor of accounting and finance, also at the Sir Virata School of Economic School of Business in UP Diliman. He is a finance professional with um, extensive experience in the development, due diligence, evaluation, and valuation, disability study development, and structuring of public private partnership and merchant acquisition deals in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. He served as chief finance officer of the Manila Water Asia Pacific, the international investment arm of Manila Water, and also worked at the PPP Center of the Philippines as development director. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration and accountancy and a master's degree in finance from UP Diliman. So we'll hear first from Dr. Sika, uh, then Mr. Velasco, then back to Dr. Sika for the part. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Good afternoon, everyone here. Again, I would like to thank our team, um, Angel Castillo, Rixi Madawian, and my co-author, Lawrence Velasco, and Lucy Melendez for helping um, get these two outputs, these two studies done. I would also like to thank uh, the very busy engineer John Santos and Ms. De Leon uh, for taking the time out to be discussants this afternoon. Now, I will be presenting today two studies. Um, the first would be the Philippine Local Government Public Expenditure Review, a survey of national government local government support programs. And the second study would be the Philippine Local Government Water Sector. For each of these, we will be presenting the motivation, research questions, scope and methodology, research results, findings, and recommendations. <clears throat> but to give you a bit of a background first, behind the motivation of both of these studies, um, Dr. Reyes already mentioned these earlier briefly, but uh, the Philippines, apart from the presidential election next year, is on the cusp of implementing a Supreme Court decision known as the Mandanas ruling in 2022. Now, the Mandanas ruling ultimately gives local governments uh, higher, uh, larger uh, intergovernmental fiscal transfers every year. Now, the estimate for its first year of implementation in 2022 is about 1.1 trillion pesos, which approximately is about a little bit more than a fifth or 20% of the 2021 4.5 trillion national budget. So this represents a huge um, increase in uh, transfers to local governments, as well as a reduction in the fiscal space for national government functions, especially those necessary to manage and recover from COVID-19. Now, what the practical options are um, are being explored by policymakers right now is to discontinue the assistance to local governments used through programs that are uh, aimed at infrastructure services, which are already devolved functions of local governments. So that is the main motivation behind these studies. We will be looking at the national government programs that have ever since decades already provided assistance to local governments in their delivery of their devolved functions. So <clears throat> let me go on to the first study, which is a survey of national government programs. So this study surveys national government programs and um, national government support programs to LGUs to guide policymakers in strengthen decentralization with the Mandana Supreme Court ruling implementation in 2022. Now, Philippine local governments were given increased spending and revenue raising responsibilities with the local government code of 1991. So this is 30 years ago. This was 30 years ago. Uh, a sec section 17, uh, was it? Yeah, section uh, in the local government code identified the functions that were devolved to local governments that local governments should uh, be the ones responsible for. Now, to finance uh, spending, apart from local government revenues raised, LGUs receive regular intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Up until now, this has been called uh, the internal revenue allotment. But thus forth, in 2022, this will now be, call, be called uh, the national tax allotment uh, allocations. Now, 
if apart from the the fiscal transfers received, LGUs also have additional financial support through the different programs lodged in the national budget. And these programs are the focus of this particular study. Now let me show you the next, uh, the research questions here. What are the national government programs that have provided additional financial support to local government units in the past decade? How much has been allocated to these programs and how were these designed, implemented, and if applicable, improved upon? What are the lessons in program implementation that could enhance national government oversight policy? So that's the motivation of this first study. Now, to give you a bit of a background first as to the size of local governments in total with respect to the economy and with respect to the public sector. So you can see here in the first slide that uh, in the first uh, graph here, that as a percent of GDP, local source income averaged only 1.2% of GDP. So what is local source income? Local government units have two general sources of income. These are internal and external. The internal sources would be tax and non-tax revenues raised by localities through the real property taxes, business taxes, and user fees. The external sources, the bulk is primarily the intergovernmental fiscal transfers that I mentioned earlier. So here we just want to see uh, the contribution of locally raised uh, income, and it's only 1.2% on average for the past decade. Now, when you take a look at LGU expenditures, with respect to uh, the GDP, it averaged about only 2.6% uh, for the past decade as well. So clearly you can see that LGU spending is greater than uh, local source uh, income raised. <clears throat> in the second graph here, you can see in terms of the public sector. So what this shows, uh, the, the blue line at the bottom is the ratio of local source tax revenues. So these are the local tax revenues collected by LGUs to the national government tax revenues. So as you can see here, this average is about 8.5%, okay, for that entire, uh, for the past decade. Now, when you look at uh, expenditures instead, local government expenditures in total as a ratio of national government expenditures averaged about 14.7%. So here also you can see that the expenditures of local governments exceed uh, what they raise locally in terms of income. Now this is seen more clearly here in the first graph on the left. Um, this shows you the two columns and it shows the trend in uh, sources of income of local governments. The shorter column would be local sources, the lighter colored column would be local sources, and the taller the darker colored column would represent external sources. And as I mentioned earlier, the bulk of external sources are transfers received from the national government. This was known up until now as the ERA and will be known starting 2022 as the NATA, as they call it. So the LGUs are clearly heavily dependent on external sources for income, averaging about 67% for the past decade. Now, where do they spend their income? They spend their income primarily on the cost of administering uh, or administration of the local government. So the topmost line in the second graph on the right, the blue one, dark blue one, shows you the share of LGU expenditures allocated to general public services. So this is the cost of running the bureaucracy. This is um, about half of it, you know, 20% uh, on the average. Um, is the second one that receives the largest share, which is social services. So here would be health, uh, social welfare, um, uh, and uh, labor, and uh, housing. So that would fall under social services. The, the third largest share or so spending of LGUs goes to economic services. So this would be agriculture <clears throat> and the rest in promotion of um, economic services. Now the, 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 the ones below, so it, capital investment expenditure is also catching up. Uh, with economic services, and the two lines below just show the debt servicing of local governments. But the, the takeaway of this particular graph is the bulk of income goes to the administration of uh, the local government unit. Now, we have a very lengthy study, and I will just be presenting the highlights 
uh, this first study. What first are the national government programs that offer local governments assistance, primarily in the devolved infrastructure services? So as you can see here in this uh, matrix here, the first column shows you the implementing agencies and um, the Department of the Interior and local government have the most number of programs. Um, and these are different programs that evolved since 2010. Okay, so that's the coverage of our particular study. But this does not go to say that they receive the largest budget. The largest budget of all these programs goes to the DPWH uh, in programs, local infrastructure programs, and the tourism road infrastructure uh, uh, programs. And the, uh, also we include here the Department of Agriculture. So here, the, the top uh, program that receives allocations as well would be a uh, farm to market road program. Okay. Now let me show you overall trends in these programs. So these programs have been receiving increasing funding since 2011, peaking at about 110.7 billion in 2018. Now in the past decade, these have averaged 0.4% of GDP, 2.1% of the budget, and 9.9% of local government expenditures. Of these programs, the top four in terms of budgetary allocations are the DPWH infrastructure program, the tourism infrastructure program, that's the second. The third would be <clears throat> the Department of Agriculture Farm to Market Road Program. And the, the, the fourth would be financial subsidy to local government units. And I'll explain this uh, in a bit more detail uh, in the next couple of slides. Now, just for those who are visual, you can see here, this is, uh, so we summed up the uh, allocations and expenditures of the uh, national government programs that offers assistance to local governments in their devolved functions. So as you can see, it has been continuously increasing, both in current and in constant prices. It's important to control for, uh, for inflation as well, to see really if the volume is increasing as well. So here you can see there's still an upward trend towards 2018. Now, as a share of GDP, national budget, and local government expenditures, these programs, as I mentioned earlier, have averaged, if you see the lowest line, the blue one, 0.4% uh, of GDP. So the sum of the budgetary allocations to these programs have uh, averaged about 2.1% uh, uh, of uh, the national government budget. And as in terms of national local government expenditures, it's averaged about 9.9% uh, in the past decade. Though you see that there's a you know sh sharp increase and then a plateauing here uh, in the last couple of years. Now let's take a look at the four. We're just going to examine the four, um, the top four programs. So this is the DPWH local infrastructure program. It shall be used for the construction and rehabilitation of local infrastructures such as local roads, bridges, academic buildings, multi-purpose buildings, systems, and flood control. So the point of the next four slides is just to see the budgetary allocations of these particular programs. And I want you to notice that the funding for these programs is erratic. Even if the overall trend of all programs is increasing, the funding is erratic. As you can see here, there are dips and, and peaks. And this has evolved, um, but only very little compared to the DILG programs in its design. It was only in recent years that uh, there were special provisions for this particular program that said that priority would be given to poorer areas in the municipalities. And this has implications on my correlation tests later on with poverty incidents. Okay. So let's go on to the DPWH Tourism Road Infrastructure Program. Uh, this is a convergence program, and it started only in 2013. Okay, this as well has received uh, erratic funding. So the blue line would be the nominal prices, and the orange line would be controlling for inflation, so that at least we, we get a better picture. Um, but they follow the same trend as well. It's erratic. Now, in the case of um, the farm-to-market roads of the Department of Agriculture, Okay, which aims to help LGUs provide better service in agriculture. The same thing goes, uh, increasing, but then still erratic. And the last one would be the DILG's Local Government Support Fund. So this was formerly known as the Financial Subsidy to Local Government Units from 2010 to 2012, and has given financial assistance to LGUs 
uh, in delivering basic services. But then this also evolved. Um, as you can see, uh, it dipped uh, until 2014, and then it started picking up after that. So this had evolved. Um, the, the former financial subsidy to local government units now became the local government support fund um, in more recent years that have specific allocations for different levels of government. So for municipalities, for cities, and for provinces. But there, these, uh, the allocations for these would focus normally on uh, infrastructure, developed infrastructure services as well. There is still a component of financial subsidy to LGUs, but this would be more for the other programs that are not covered by those specific for uh, cities, municipalities, and provinces. So examples of these would be, I think, for the purchase of motor vehicles and such. So, but in any case, again, um, there was a rapid increase and decline, and um, this is the only program that experienced most changes in the past decade. So, although there was an overall increasing trend in national government, local government support program expenditures, individual program allocations were generally erratic. And this would, I guess, depend on the ability to be able to, to, to get allocations uh, through the budget process. Now, the DILG LGSF programs were redesigned more often than the DPWHS local and tourism infrastructure and the DA's farm to market roads programs. So, the most redesigned, as I mentioned earlier, were in the LGSF uh, programs. Now, <clears throat> we experienced a bit of a challenge. This was conducted during the um, pandemic where everyone was work from home. So, we really wanted, as, as um, Dr. Reyes mentioned earlier, to be able to estimate the absorptive capacity and say something substantive as to the utilization of these funds. However, it was only for very few programs that we were able to get complete budgetary data. When I said that, when I say this, it means that we were able to get data on the appropriations to the allotments, to the um, obligations, to the disbursements, that whole complete cycle. And it was only for, I think, Sunny Too Big and the BUB programs that we were able to um, estimate uh, the utilization rates. And what we observed is that for these national government, uh, local government support programs, there was high utilization. This averaged about 95%. Okay, and why do I want to highlight this? Well, because if you compare it to the utilization of the local development fund of local government units, um, which averages about, uh, it feels in comparison because it averages about 75, 76% across LGUs. Now, what is the relevance of this? Um, if these programs, the national government programs, will be discontinued, local governments will have to take over the responsibility and fund investment programs and infrastructure spending. And the fund that they use to, to implement these investment programs is what you call the local development fund. Okay, And the local development fund is 20% of the annual uh, intergovernmental fiscal transfers received by local governments. And this is very crucial since um, first, when the Mandana's ruling will be implemented, the allocation or the, the, the amount that should be allocated to the local development fund should be, would be larger because of the larger transfers. So 20% of the transfers. Um, and uh, and this, yeah, uh, I will be discussing this uh, in more detail later on. This is very a very important um, finding to guide policymakers moving forward. Now, we did a bit of an experiment um, because we had um, data from previous studies. And what we looked at, what if these support programs are discontinued? And the national government decides to have an equalization grant. So the question is, should this be designed based on local infrastructure gaps. Okay, and what we did was we looked at the examined correlations of regional infrastructure gaps, which we had estimated in a previous study. The infrastructure gaps totaled about 170 billion pesos for municipalities in the Philippines to be able to provide local roads, uh, rural health units, and evacuation centers. We correlated this with poverty incidents and uh, good governance to see if there are higher gaps, infrastructure gaps in regions with higher poverty incidence or with lower proportion of municipalities that receive the seal of good local governance. So what does this mean? The question is, okay, are there higher infrastructure gaps in regions with higher poverty incidence? 
Let's take a look at the correlations. And the second question is, are there higher infrastructure gaps in regions that have a lower proportion of municipalities passing the seal of good local governance? So the results show there is no strong evidence to suggest that regions with larger infrastructure gaps have higher poverty incidence. Second, there is evidence though of weak correlation between higher poverty incidence and lower proportion of municipal seal of local governance recipients in the region. So what this means is that, okay, and this affirms our the results of a previous study we did on the Performance Challenge Fund. It seems that in areas where uh, there are poorer or poorer local governments, they have challenges in getting the seal of good local governance. Now, the, the other evidence we found is that there is no evidence that regions with larger infrastructure gaps have a lower proportion of municipal seal of good local governance recipients. So these would all, uh, all have implications moving forward if there would be uh, a, a redesigned um, um, fiscal equalization grant or a special program for local governments. Now, what are the recommendations? If the national government decides to discontinue these programs, there should be policy to ensure the compliance with the local government code mandate that LGUs must spend at least 20% of the received annual intergovernmental fiscal transfers. Um, infrastructure spending through the LDF would help jumpstart the economy into recovery and reduce poverty, given evidence of the high multiplier effect of government infrastructure spending on regional income. So this is a, a result of a forthcoming study by Debuca Gonzalez. Now, another recommendation is that if the national government decides to continue these programs, but decides to create a fiscal equalization grant first, these should be aligned with interventions programs to be implemented under the Seal of Good Local Governance Act of 2019 and the Community-Based Monitoring System Act to avoid redundant spending. These two laws have provisions to provide assistance to poorer municipalities. So these should be aligned if there is a fiscal equalization grant to, to avoid duplicative efforts. Uh, second, the equalization grant should have clear objectives, criteria, and targeting of LGUs. The evidence that there is no strong correlation between regional poverty incidents and infrastructure gaps should guide policymakers to be specific in defining the objective of the intervention. Is it to reduce gaps or is it to um, alleviate poverty um, and such? Now, the study also provided evidence that there was weak correlation between regional allocations and expenditures and poverty incidents for programs that claim to prioritize poorer areas. So this is what I mentioned earlier. There were certain programs that claim to prioritize poorer areas, but when we looked at the regional allocations, we saw weak evidence of this. Now, on to the second study. The second study is a perfect example of a devolved function that local governments have been receiving assistance from the national government in the past 30 years of decentralization, but also has national implications to be able to attain universal potable water access by 2030 under the SDG uh, number six. Okay. Now, water is a complex good. Okay. The different stages of its provision determines the kind of government intervention needed. This is why the water sector is a very tricky sector. When you talk about source water, economic theory would define this as a common resource problem. So what the common resource problem is that if you do not regulate its usage, there would be overconsumption of this particular common resource. So the NWRB is the one that um, does this form of regulation in the case of the Philippines. Now, if we look at water uh, in terms of potable water supply provision, you know, um, getting the water, um, processing it so it would be potable and distributing it to households, this is perceived as a natural monopoly. Okay, what is a natural monopoly? A natural monopoly is when there are huge sunk costs necessary in the provision of this particular service. So in this case, it is very costly to put up a water system. So this is perceived to be a natural monopoly. Um, in these cases, it is acceptable to have fewer suppliers or water service providers, but there should be regulation in price and the quality of water to ensure that uh, consumers are not taken advantage of when it comes to price. So there's another form of regulation when it comes to potable water supply provision. 
Now, the objective of the study is to present the landscape of local government water service delivery, identify institutional weaknesses, highlight successes within the current framework, and share national government public sector efforts, um, uh, national government programs such as sending to it, uh, and the LUWA. So we'll be presenting these interventions later on. Now, the research questions are, how can LGUs provide efficient and sufficient water supply for its current and future population? How do LGUs currently deliver water services? What is the current framework? Who are the actors and what are their mandates? And how can the institutional environment be improved upon? Now, before I give you over to uh, Professor Velasco to discuss the landscape, let me just present to you, aligned with the earlier presentation, the three public sector local water supply interventions that I want to highlight. So the primary program the national government has to address waterless municipalities is called the Sagana at Ligtas na Tubig sa Lahat. So this is the Salin Tubig program. And as you can see, these are the expenditures for the Salin Tubig from 10, 2012 to 2018 and the trends as well as erratic. Okay. The same thing in the case of the local government support fund assistance to municipalities, which is an evolution of the bottom-up budgeting program. So here also, we find erratic funding, but this is fine because this particular program can be used for more than for uh, beyond water services. So it can be used for the building of local roads, rural health unit, and evacuation centers. And finally, um, there is a government corporation, and we have a discussion with us right now, representing the local water utilities administration. So they have the primary mandate of giving affordable loans to local water districts. And the sources of funds for lending comes from internally generated funds, budgetary support from the national government via the GAA, and loans from multilateral organizations. As, and as you can see here, this represents the budgetary support received by this government corporation. It is erratic as well, which has implications in the ability to assist local water districts. Now, I hand you over to Lawrence uh, to discuss the landscape and regulatory and institutional issues. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you, Justine. So uh, we'll go to the institutional elements of this uh, study. So when we talk about the water sector, uh, everyone in the water sector uh, describes it in one word, and it is fragmented. You know, so this is this uh, quotation is from the Philippine Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan 2019-2030 of MEDA. And it it it's something that people from the sector has already clamored for for a long time. And uh, what this study wants to uh, to do is to bring to light and provide context. When you say fragmented, what does it really mean and what does it entail? You know, and, and therefore, that's the objective of uh, the study. Uh, it's been well documented, it's been well um, researched that it's fragmented, but usually details are not provided. What has been the impact on the sector because of this fragmentation. And so through this simple review of institutional mandates, there are already clear evidences of how this fragmentation uh, is uh, affect, may affect the performance of uh, achieving our target to have universal uh, water access by 2030. Okay, So according to the 2015 FICE 87% of access to water. The target is to increase that to 100% by 2030. However, even though 87% of access to water, only 44% of access by household connection. So yung mayroong mga grip, mayroong mga water na pipes going to households and to faucets, only 44% have that. So some of them, mayroong balloon, mayroong communal water uh, points. No? So that's how they how water access is being defined currently and the 2030 PWSSMP targets a 77% level 3 system uh, connections by 2030 so more or less to increase it by uh, to double this more or less to 77% you know, and that is the 2030 target next slide please so Uh, yeah, so another way to categorize or to, to, to describe fragmentation in the sector is just by taking this data from Listan Tubig. So Listan Tubig is a database by the MWRB of all 
uh, and Lua and other agencies. This is a joint effort among them. Um, if you will see, there are 27,000 water service providers in the Philippines. And despite having 27,000 water supply um, providers in the Philippines as of September 2020, only 5,853 or 22% of that total uh, perform level three services. When we say level three services, you know pipe water connection up to the private water point or uh, essentially the household connection. So even though there are 27,000 uh, water supply providers and there's 87% water access, only 44% or equivalent to around 5,800 water service providers provide household connections. And so that's something that we could still work on to improve our uh, attainment of SDG 6. Okay. To be able to do this, uh, uh, we have to rely on uh, government and the private sector to, uh, to attain universal, uh, universal access. I think what's worth noting also is that if you want to ensure more level three services, which is the household connection services, if you look at this data, 37% of level three water service providers are actually government uh, initiated programs like LGU run water utilities, 1,470 divided by over 5.8 and plus water districts, which are also government uh, entities, 670. And in fact, majority, a huge majority of water district operations is level three water systems. So to be able to increase that, government has a role of making sure that uh, investments are in place so that it can help attain the uh, 2030 uh, universal access tools of the SDG. Next slide. So let's discuss two specific water uh, specific agencies in detail. Okay. So the first one is the local water utility station. As mentioned by Justine, this is one of the critical important agencies in um, for us to make sure that uh, we can attain SDG six. So, um, it is a GOCC form under PD 198. It has oversight powers it, uh, uh, over water districts, which are uh, likewise GOCCs, so, which perform or which operate uh, water uh, water utilities in the provinces. Okay. Uh, another aspect of oversight, if you look at the uh, the, the history of uh, several agencies is that it also has oversight actually with rural or over rural water works and sanitation associations and that's by via EO 128 of 1987 when the rural works water works development corporation was uh, abolished Lua was actually the successor agency of, of uh, RWDC and as such they they inherited the oversight powers of Lua and subsequently, there have been no laws to change that, or laws or executive orders to change that. In terms of powers, they primarily provide loans to water districts, and in providing loans, they help water districts uh, uh, implement their water service programs. And as part of their, um, I mean, part and parcel of their uh, lending powers, they also provide technical assistance to water districts. They set technical standards and key performance indicators for water districts, and they review rates for water districts, so making sure that they are sustainable enterprises. Uh, in terms of technical standards, it's outlined in the Lua Memorandum Circular, and the water rate setting principle is essentially uh, a review if a 10-year business plan. And the main check is to just to review the business plan, its assumptions, and to check whether through the proposed tariffs, uh, they have appropriate cash balance over the 10 year period so that they can sustain operations. So it's not uh, apparent or it's not um, explicit with respect to uh, recovery of capital expenditures, a long term program, or a return. The objective is to uh, make sure that the water district becomes sustainable, and that is through the review of its cash flows. Uh, next slide. 
Another critical agency is the National Water Resources Board. Okay? So uh, it has oversight functions on what, uh, water utilities in general. Okay? And based on their, uh, based on their uh, manual for uh, or mandate, they have three categories of uh, agencies or three categories of water supply providers that oversight on. First is category A, which is private utilities. So if you're, for example, a uh, 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 homeowners association, and in your subdivision, the homeowners association is the one operating the private utility at, within the homeowner, within the subdivision, your regulatory agency for technical and rate setting with the WRB specifically under category A. Okay. The same rules provide that category B are, is also under NWRB ambit, and it is defined as government-owned water utilities. And it's also included in their, uh, in their manual or in their uh, memorandum circular that it is optional for government-owned water service utilities. Uh, that's the only mention of it, and it does not explain under the memorandum circular how is it going to be implemented. And category C is community-based utilities. So examples are Barangay Water Works and Rural Water Works Services Administration uh, associations. No. So here we see initial sources of conflict in terms of, of, of mandates, no? particularly in category B and category C, which we'll explain more later. What are the powers of NWRB? They control permits, so yung extraction of resources. And second, they regulate the utilities by issuing the certificate of public convenience or the franchise. Okay. In terms of water rate setting principle, category A and B, uh, cash flows of a business plan is reviewed and a rate, water rate is set depending on the allowable return. Okay. So here, there is a concept of return since there are um, they are uh, particularly uh, reviewing private water utilities also. Uh, later, we'll have more uh, discussions on, on this. For category C, it's not return-based, but based on uh, a revenue requirement uh, methodology. So essentially, you know, compute lang how much uh, rate is needed so that they will break even in a certain year. However, OPEX, contingencies, depreciation, and good service. Okay. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Um, it's a long paper, but we are going. To, we are summarizing the key findings. Uh, finding is that there are overlaps in regulation. So let's look at the fourth and fifth columns. Uh, if you look at the regulatory agencies uh, for LGU run utilities, there is an apparent overlap. So because LGU run utilities, since they are created by their by their respective local legislative councils, no. Essentially, the regulation they were created under the legislative uh, council, and therefore the, the legislative councils could provide the necessary regulation. However, NWRB in its memorandum circular all, also provides an option for LGUs to to uh, to be regulated by NWRB. The method on how that is going to be done, what documents are needed, whether that's legal for LGUs to do was not discussed in the memorandum circular. So uh, I'm uh, well, well, there could be some implementation issues there because it's not clear whether uh, how, how this is going to be implemented. There's an option, but is it legal on the side of the LGU to do this? Because it could be legal on the side of on WRB. So that needs further study. For water districts, the same, because water districts are uh, government-owned corporations and it being optional, um, it provides some uncertainty. You know, um, will water districts be penalized by opting uh, NWRB uh, uh, regulation and they were created under PD1? So th that's a source of conflict. Another one is RWSAs because DUA has mandate under EO124, but NWRB also includes them under category C. So here, there's a need to, because it's difficult for these uh, uh, government water service utilities 
to implement programs if there are uncertainty in terms of how they how are they are going to be regulated. No? And um, I think clarity is needed with, with, with this one. Another finding is uh, in terms of overlap, not really regulation, but there's no very limited investment coordination in the sector. If you want to achieve 100% universal access, someone has to keep track of what everyone is doing. Uh, currently, um, based pa lang sa how we gather data, it's very difficult to gather data for everything because no one is um, collating, I guess, what, what LGU run utilities are doing, what water districts are doing, but what does that? So at least meron sila doon. Uh, BWSA or RWSAs are doing. So that could be, um, it's very difficult to assess whether where you are in your goals if you don't know the performance and you don't know their needs. No? And we'll discuss more of that uh, later. So again, we can go to key finding number two. Uh, another key finding just by reviewing uh, the, the key performance indicator by Lua and NWRB based on their um, published memorandum or memoranda to their, to their oversight uh, as oversight agency. Uh, there are only differences or misalignments in the text standards that we require. Why do I feel that this is important? This is important that it is aligned because key performance indicators dictate investments. Okay? If, for example, let's go to 24 7 water service. If NWRB is only requiring greater than or equal to 12 hours, then there's no incentive for the, for for the, for some uh, some water service providers to invest so that it becomes 24 hours. Pero for Lua, they are measured in terms of percent of households enjoying 24/7. So it is clear that 24/7 is their target. No, then it will dictate the kind of investments that. Uh, another is collection efficiency. It is part of the KPIs of Lua, but not for NWRB. And if you're, um, if you're cash flow based in terms of how you set rates, then that will be a problem, and there could be inefficiencies that, be, that can be passed on to the private to the consumers because of of this. Uh, the opposite is true rin naman because if we look at uh, customer feedback, uh, the memorandum circular of Lua does not include it, no? but uh, it's included in the uh, in the uh, then MC of NWRB. And so therefore, if you look at this, um, Lua is not incentivized to, uh, to, um, to do this or to invest here. Next. So next slide, please. So essentially, monitoring technical standards is important because that's how we establish prudence of operations. And uh, having a unified technical standard for everyone ensure that everyone is working towards the same goals, all water service providers. Okay? And lastly, uniform standards will facilitate allocation of funding support. Because if it's clear that NRW is deteriorating in one area, then uh, and it is computed the same with the same standards for everyone, then it's easier to allocate funding support to all of these areas. Next slide. E-53 is key differences in water rate setting principles. I won't delve too much because it's going to be very long. But essentially, um, uh, this means that there are different ways by which our consumers are being charged depending on who their regulators are. And mind you, LGUs, LGU water utilities, they can eat their own water rate setting formula according to whatever is in their legislative franchise na binigay nila to, the, to whoever is uh, doing uh, uh, operating the water supply system in their areas. So there could be so many water rate setting principles which may work or which may find it, we, we may find it difficult to uh, to, to to monitor and actually to check whether they are passing on the proper uh, next slide uh, next 
the coordination. Um, I think what's clear is in terms of water resource management, we need looking at watersheds, looking at our lakes and rivers. No, there seems to be coordination in that no? because MWRD is very active there, and DNR is also part and parcel of that. Uh, that uh, uh, that monitoring. No? But when we're talking about bringing water to the household, the, port, the, the, the portion of the value chain where you treat water and provide potable water to homes, is an agency that looks into the performance of everyone. And that causes concern because uh, investments can be um, heavily uh, uh, or directed to a certain area, but nothing happens. We have an example here in Taitai one where it's the same road. There could be two um, two water systems, the parallel lines. So to think in Ipa 100% the area na yan. So it could have been the pani could have been used for other purposes no, or other expansion. And just a look at Listahang uh, Tubig. There are multiple service providers in one city. This is not to say that these water districts and LGUs or cities are really overlapping in terms of investments. No, we didn't go that far. But this is saying that there could be some uh, opportunities for efficiency no, in these areas if there could be some form of coordination between all of these players. No, and, uh, and I think that is critical so that we can ensure that resources are funneled to the proper investment achieve universal access. And lastly, finding number five uh, is the funding with respect to water district. Aside from investment coordination, funding must also be coordinated. You know? According to the Philippine Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan, 278 billion pesos is expected to be spent from 2019 to 2023, of which 49% is to be spent through private loans and private providers, which means this is the private sector. But no one is actually monitoring the private sector here. Have they spent the amount that they need to spend based on the master plan so that we can reach the target by 2030? No agency is doing that, or at least um, uh, there's no database on that. So I think that's very important. And by monitoring, uh, financing so that we can direct them properly to water districts and LGUs based on their capacity to have sustainable operations. Okay, and then I'll be I'll return it to uh, Dr. Sikat for the Okay, thank you so much, Lawrence, for a summary of our findings. As you can see, obstinate fragmentation in the local water sector is primarily due to ambiguous and overlapping institutional mandates. Identified weaknesses in institutional mandates both cause and exacerbate the absence of consistently and regularly reported data, which poses challenges in monitoring and evaluation uh, of the water service providers for sector norms. So as uh, uh, Lawrence mentioned, no single water-related planning agency keeps track of progress and investment. And as we were doing the study, we looked at sources. The CMCI index, uh, we looked at Listahang Tubig, and we looked at local government municipal submissions to us with regards to their infrastructure. So it is very challenging to, to put together all of this information to make sense of them. Now, uh, another finding, the inability to effectively assess the impact or success of water service provision results in fragmented policy programs and interventions. Now, we observed, though, that the, of the national government support programs to local water, there was almost 100% utilization. But there was, we also looked at correlations, there was weak evidence that their prioritization criteria of poverty incidence and uh, the proportion of waterless households accounts for variations in expenditures. So there should be better targeting. Ultimately, that's what this result is saying. Now, what are the recommendations? Streamline and align various rules and regulations relating to the sector. Provide a definitive streamlining of economic regulation for the sector. Align the formulation of technical regulation and operating standards. Uh, secondly, enhance investment coordination within the sector. Empower a central coordinating body to keep track of targets, investments, and funding needs regardless of water supply implementation entity. Here, we are not proposing or pushing for any particular central coordinating body. 
This could be done through a strengthened uh, mandate of existing water bodies or creation of a committee. So we're not promoting any one, but it just has to be a body that looks into this. Um, that's what we're promoting. There should also be systematic planning and funding uh, support for water utilities. And if any national government support program for local, local water services will be pursued post Mandanas, these must be integrated in the central coordinating body to avoid the duplication of efforts and um, redundant spending. So thank you so much for your patience with our very long presentation. Over to you, Sheila. And thank you, to, uh, Dr. Justin Sikat and Professor Aldous Velasco for your candid assessment of the uh, national government support programs for uh, our local government units, as well as the issues founding the um, efficient and effective provision of uh, water at the local level. So at this point, uh, friends, um, let us hear what our discussants have to say about the findings and recommendations of the two studies. So uh, what we did was we invited a regulator and a service provider uh, to get their insights on the issues and recommendations raised by our uh, presenters. So our first presenter is from the Local Water Utilities Administration, or LUA. She is the division manager of LUA's corporate planning office, and she joined LUA in 1982. She has a degree in business administration in economics. Friends, let us listen to the comments of Ms. Elvira De Leon. Ms. De Leon, the floor is now yours. Ma'am LD? Yes. Good afternoon, yes. everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well. Uh, the organizer of this event asked me to comment on both studies presented. However, most of my comments relate to the second study because this is where uh, most of the issues uh, is understandable. So uh, let me begin with the first study. But uh, I, I only have one comment on the first study is and this is on the second recommendation uh, so the study's recommendation though there is a basis to discontinue some NGLGU programs because of the increase in transfers to local governments there might still be a need to have some programs that are targeted towards the lower income local governments next slide please so LUA is a GOCC with a, with a specialized lending function for the promotion and development of water supply system in the Philippines. So as part of LUA's social responsibility, it shall continue to secure grant funds from the national government to support the water supply development programs in local income municipalities. It shall develop innovative funding solutions to address funding gaps in less disadvantaged communities. So that's all for the first study. So next slide, please. The next slide, uh, the next slide is uh, refers to the situation, the current situation in the uh, local government water system. So as I found it, the findings reflect the problems and challenges facing the water sector. So next slide, please. So I won't uh, go to the specific problems. So I will just uh, focus on the key findings. And uh, because I believe those specific issues are longstanding, they, have, they, they are there for a long time in the water sector. So the key findings in your study speaks about regulations such as overlapping re regulation, misaligned technical operating standards, differences in water rate setting principles, and another key findings refers to institutional or lack of investment coordination. And uh, another finding is, is in financing, which you said funding must match the state of water districts. Then the next slide, please. Uh, the general Findings on the on the other hand pointed to three major problems in the water sector, and that's uh, fragmented water governance, 
difficulty in generating data, hindering planning and monitoring, and the lack of impact assessment. So next slide, please. Let's go to your recommendations. So your recommendations focus on three areas, and that's in regulation, uh, regulation, uh, and you suggest to streamline and align various rules and regulations re re relating to the sector in order to provide a definitive streamlining of economic regulation for the sector and to align the formulation of technical regulation with operating standards. So another recommendation of the study, uh, next slide please, refers to institutional and financing. So this study proposed the creation of a central coordinating body and and in financing according, accordingly, better coordination and financing for local water utilities must be enhanced. So next slide, please. So the findings and recommendations, I found it similar with the Philippine Water Sector and Sanitation Master Plan. So the, uh, the Philippine Water Sector or master plan. So let me walk you through Muna with the Philippine Water Supply and Sanitation Master Master Plan. So the goal, the goal of the uh, Philippine Water Sector and Sanitation Master Plan that by 2030 all Filipinos shall have access to sustainable and affordable safe water supply and to adequate and safely manage sanitation services. Next slide, please. So in order to achieve the said goal, eight key reform agenda have been developed. So these are the eight key reform agenda. Establishing effective water supply and sanitation sector institution, strengthening the regulatory environment, balancing water supply and demand, building climate resiliency, creating and ensuring effective water supply and sanitation services, enabling access to funding and financing, managing and data information, driving research and developments. So four of these are mentioned in the findings and recommendations of your study. And they are number one, establishing effective water supply sanitation institutions, strengthening the regulatory environment. Number six, enabling access to funding and financing. Uh, you talk about some uh, financing and then uh, about uh, difficulty in data gathering. So it's number seven in the reform agenda. It's managing and data information. So next slide, please. And the key initiatives as mentioned in the plan are three. So it's the creation of an independent financial and economic regulator for water supply and sanitation, the creation of an apex body, for the water resources sector. And number three is about financing. This is a unified financing framework for water supply and sanitation. I have a note here about UFF or the unified financing framework. Uh, UFF is a framework for consolidation and rationally allocating available financial resources to the water service providers, subsidies and loans among others. So next slide, please. So uh, I would like to update you on the latest proposals and developments in the water sector agenda. This is in re my report is in reference to the World Water Day report last March 22. So the latest developments in the water sector agenda. On 18 November 2020, the substitute house bill which consolidate all 30 bills that seeks the creation of the Department of Water Resources was deliberated and was consequently approved by the House Committee on Appropriations. The committee's endorsement in plenary for the second reading is already well underway. So next slide, please. So the Department of Water Resources. This is a creation of an apex body for the water sector responsible for water resources planning, policy formulation and management of the ownership, appropriation, utilization, 
exploitation, development, sustainability, and protection of water resources in the Philippines except fisheries or aquaculture. Next slide, please. And the highlights. The Department of Water Resources shall function as the overall apex body for the entire water resources sector, created by consolidating water-related mandates and fully absorbing the functions of relevant agencies, units in the water sector. It will oversee the over planning, programming, policy formulation, and management in the water resource sector. Next slide, please. It will also be the primary agency responsible for planning and policy formulation towards attaining universal access to safe water supply and improved sanitation. It will be the primary agency to implement the Water Code of the Philippines and the Philippine Clean Water Act. So next slide, please. So another initiative is the creation of a Water Regulatory Commission. The proposed commission will streamline and rationalize the economic reg regulation of water supply and sanitation service providers throughout the country. Next slide, please. Hi highlights. Uh, the Water Re Regulatory Commission is proposed as an independent and quasi-judicial regulatory body of the water supply and sanitation subsector. It will undertake licensing, tariff setting, performance monitoring, address the dual completing functions of regulating and implementing water supply and sanitation projects, and ensure transparency and predictability in economic regulation of all WSPs. So next slide, please. Separates economic regulation from policy plan formulation and coordination source regulation and addresses fragmentation by subsuming the regula regulatory division units of NWRB, MWSS, LUA, uh, LLDA, SBMA, TESA, and TESA. Harmonizes regulatory practices, processes, and fees. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this slide uh, illustrates the path to water reform. So the current uh, framework of the sector is that the National Water Resources Board and the River Basin Control Office handles the resource regulation, policy, and planning. While there are six agencies involved in the economic regulation of water service providers, and these are NWRB, LUA, MW. SSRO, CHESA, PESA, and LGUs. So in the interim and short term, uh, the National Water Management Council shall handle the resource regulation, policy, and planning, while the six agency will remain as the economic regulators. So in the long term, in the long term, it will be the Department of Water Resources that will handle handle the resource regulation, policy, and planning, and uh, the economic re regulation will be handled by a single body, the Water Regulatory Commission. So next slide, please. This slide shows the stages leading to the implementation of the water reform. So we're just waiting for the final approval of the House bill. Then uh, the next step will be the crafting and approval of the Senate bill version. Then the next step will be uh, bicameral deliberation and approval. Next step will be the formulation and approval of the implementing rules and regulations. And lastly, is, security, is securing budgetary requirements. So for the implementation of the House of this bill, uh, the next step will be the formulation of the National Water Resources Management Framework Plan, the setting up of uh, DWR central and regional offices, and the formulation of operational plans for units with DWR. Then update inventory of water resources, and last is the creation of regional base offices. Next slide, please. 
So this is the proposed structure of the Department of Water Resources. So as you can see, uh, the Department of Water Resources will have an administrative supervision over the Water Regulatory Commission. Then attached agencies are MWSS, DIA, and LUA, and the LLDA, and the rest, the water-related mandates will be subsumed in the Department of Water Resources. So next slide, please. In the next slide, I will I would just like to share uh, LUA's um, meeting the national target. So what is LUA's goal? Adequate and sustainable safe water and sanitation services in the countries by 2030 through self-reliant local water districts. So this is consistent with our national goal of providing uh, universal access by uh, to sanitation and to water supply and sanitation by 2030. So next slide, please. And what are the strategies of LUA? Expand COVID age and reliable water service at affordable rates. Provide adequate sanitation. Ensure reliable and economically viable water districts. Institutionalize good governance in water districts. Ensure financial viability and operational sustainability of LUA. Next slide, please. Ensure delivery of efficient and effective financial, technical, and institutional development assistance. And lastly, develop competent, efficient, and dedicated civil servants. So next slide, please. And here are the key programs and initiatives of LUA. These are based on reaching our goals. So these are the programs of LUA. Expansion of water supply coverage, implementation of sanitation projects in areas covered by the Manila Bay Mandamus, Adoption of design and build scheme to accelerate project implementation, strengthening LUA's regulatory function, and enhancing LUA's financing capacity. So we're doing this amidst the challenges in the water sector. So lastly, in closing, uh, next slide please. In closing, uh, the Philippine water supply sector faces the biggest challenge of attaining the universal goal of providing access to water and sanitation by 2030. So if the current setup in the water supply remain in the water supply sector remains, the risk of not attaining the 20 tar targets is very high. So there is a pressing need to legislate the bill that seeks to create an, ep an apex body that will oversee the overall planning, programming, policy formulation and management in the water resources sector and a water regulatory body to address the fragmented, poorly enforced and low coverage regulatory regime in the water sector. That's all. Thank you. Maraming salamat din po, Ms. Elvira De Leon of the LUA. So I was uh, checking our chat box and uh, questions uh, started, uh, have started it so just keep them coming friends uh we will have um open for on with our uh, presenters and discussions will um accommodate your questions okay so from a regulator's perspective let us move to the viewpoint of a water service provider and we have with us today engineer carlos santos who's a member of the board of directors of the Santa Maria Water District in Bulacan. So previously, he was chair of the board of directors and also served as general manager of the water district. He is an electrical engineer and educator. He graduated from the Mapua's, uh, Mapua Institute of Technology and completed his master's degree um, in education, major in educational administration at the University of the Philippines. He also served in various capacities as secretary, vice president for Luzon, and eventually the president of the Philippine Association of Water Districts from uh, February 2018 to February 2020. Engineer um, Carlos Santos, sir, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Good evening, everyone. 
So I'll be presenting an alternative narration of my reaction to the recommendations made on uh, the paper of um, uh, Mr. Velasco. So to start with, uh, with respect to the recommendation number one, we, we all agree that NWR are planners in economic regulation of water service providers in the country. There's no question about it. They are the leaders. While the operational parameters may be common to water service providers, the challenge is how to align these regulatory parameters, regardless of the mandate of the water supply provider or pro operator, for profit by the water private operators and non-profit like in the case of local water districts and LGU run water utilities. An, an ROI or a return of investment of 10 to 12 percent is allowed for a private entity, whereas for a local water district, operation is only on a full cost recovery. For local water districts, disposition of income is also specified in, in, in our charter, specifically defined in, in PD-198 as amended, where section 41 uh, states that the income of the water district shall be disposed according to the following priorities. One is to pay for its contractual and statutory obligations and to meet, to meet its essential current operating expenses. Number two, to allocate at least 50% of the balance as a reserve for debt service and operating and maintenance to be used for such purposes only during periods of calamities, force majeure, and unforeseen event. Number three, the, to allocate the residue of a reserve exclusively for expansion and improvements of its physical facilities. That is how we're going to dispose of our income. And last private entities who pay taxes and pay offs in dividends to stockholders. Local water district as a government-owned and controlled corporation does not remit revenues to the national treasury and are exempted from paying income taxes. A privilege granted as stated in Section 46 of PD-198 as amended and further reiterated in Republic Act 10026. These basic differences a profound uh, effect on the determination of water tariff and all its underlying parameters. Approval of water tariff for those local water districts with private partner has drawn the issue of economic regulation further. For GCC, the Office of the Government Corporate Council opines that since the water district has assumed the function of regulator to the contract monitoring unit or CMU, the applicant for water tariff adjustment should be the private partner. Hence, it should be with the NWRB. Lua, as the regulator of water districts, insists that it should be with Lua. With this development, we could have local water districts whose water tariffs or rates are approved by Lua with different parameters, formula, versus the water rates of local water districts with private partners approved by NWRB. Among other things, this should be resolved soonest. We fully agree that there should be a uniform KPI and operational standards for all water service providers, regardless of the regulator. Harmonizing their standards may level the playing field of operations for all water service providers, which may be helpful in realizing the goals and objective of SDG number six, the Philippine Development Plan 2022, and the Philippine Water Supply and Sanitation Master Plan 2030. As it is happening now, we lowest regulatory power over local water district with private partners over only the water district with limited functions and not the private partner? Who would regulate the partner? Is it the contract monitoring unit or the water district? or the NWRB. Nobody seems to assess the performance of the private partner at the moment. Lua and the OGCC are in loggerhead in this matter. Lua is a its power to regulation, audit, review under PD-198, but OGCC on the other hand has opined that the partner is a private entity not under the jurisdiction of Lua's 
supervisory power. While LUA's technical and operating standards do not consider customer feedback or satisfaction surveys, as emphasized on the study, uh, unlike in the NWRD uh, standards, many local water districts have already acquired their individual ISO quality management system certifications, duly recognized by the Government Quality Management Committee, where customer satisfaction, as we very well know, is one of the major KPIs for a local water district to consistently pass either the annual surveillance audit or ISO recertification every three years. And I would like to uh, say also that other than DUA, local water districts are also subject to various regulations. Napakadaming regulatory body who regulates the water district. And to name a few, the Department of Health, the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water, and the Water Safety Plan, the, D the DBM, the Revised Local Water Districts Manual on Categorization, Recategorization, and other related matters, or we call it the LWD Macro, the Civil Service Commission, the Omnibus Rules on Appointments and Other Human Resource Actions, the DNR, the Environmental Compliance Certificate, the DPWH, Road Right of Way, the local government units, the various municipal ordinances, AO25 of the DAP, performance-based bonus, and the, of course, the commission and audit, annual financial audit with all the AOMs and perhaps notice of, the, the notice of disallowances issued. The NWRB, on the other hand, we also apply for water permit applications only because the DOJ has ruled that local water districts are exempt from paying annual water charges. For recommendation number two, enhancing investment coordination within the sector, I would say that funding for local water districts continues demand for water source development, expansion and improvement of water supply facilities, investment requirements for sanitation projects and other improvement programs has been and still is the biggest concern of local water districts. Funding for this program is not easy to acquire and takes time as well. Local water district can no longer solely rely on its annual revenues for operations to support these capital intensive activities. Majority of funds for the development of local water districts generally comes from LUA. For semi and credit worthy local water districts, funding may be sourced out from government financial institutions such as the Land Bank of the Philippines and the Development Bank of the Philippines, subject to grant of waiver from LUA. In both cases, a confirmation from the Department of Finance and a position of, uh, in a positive opinion from the Monetary Board of the Banco Central of the Philippines is necessary prior to grant irrespective of the amount of food. The expectations for local water district to attain the, object the objectives of PDP 2020-2022 and PWSSMP 2030 and the Manila Bay are quite high and requires enormous amount of capital investment year on year. To attain these targets of 100% access to water supply by 2030, and 100% access to sanitation services by 2030. This shall require development of new water sources with preference to surface water because further utilization of groundwater has become critical and poses environmental and geological risk. Expansion of water supply distribution system to provide level three water supply access to 100% of the population develop and construct collection, treatment, and disposal facilities for wastewater. To tell you the enormity of the financial needs of a water district, just like my water district, the Santa Maria Water District, in 2015, we conducted a 15-year development plan with the objective of providing water supply security and providing access to potable and safe water supply for the entire municipality. 
The cost of realizing the objective came out at around 700 million pesos. Around 46 million pesos per year will have to be invested by the Santa Maria Water District to be able to come out and realize these objectives. This is yet to include the investment cost for our sanitation program. The question is, where will SMWD get the necessary funds to be able to accomplish these targets and objectives? That is the basic question. LWD are sometimes faced with an unprogrammed expenditures due to road and bridge projects of the DPWAs and so on. Uh, sometimes there are damages caused by contractors. However, the cost we have long proposed to the DPWAs that the cost of moving, removing, or relocating LWD facilities be incorporated in the program of work and cost estimate of the project by the DPWAs. To tell you honestly, we are a bit envious to some local water district who get grants, domestic or international, congressional funds, and other JAPDA funds such as the Solid Tubig, the TUA, and NSMP, funds for development of water supply and sanitation. One water district in Panay was able to construct a water impounding facility, pipelines, and water treatment plant to provide additional water supply to the entire municipality, fully funded by the Congressman, Congresswoman's Priority Development Assistance Fund, or SPIDA. However, targeting where to put these funds, which shall have sustained substantial impact to the attainment of water supply goals, is quite unclear. As mentioned in the study, the classic example of one water district in Palawan cannot be understated. Absence of coordination and cooperation is evident, and the outcome in many ways does not contribute to the PDP and the PWSSMP objectives. There was a policy that the solid tubing funds, or through the unified financing framework, which was mentioned by the Lua reactor, and these PIs, the, the solid tubing is to be in marked to Lua for the development of water supply when a duly established local water district exists in a municipality or city. And in the absence of a water district, Stalin Tobi funds shall be earmarked to the DILG for the provision of water supply. It would be music to the ears of local water districts to partake on the anticipated increase in internal revenue allotment of LGUs brought about by the Supreme Court ruling on the Mandanas case. It would definitely be beneficial to local water districts as this would be a source of free funds. We hope and pray that this would materialize with no strings and politics attached relative to the grant and with the sole objective of providing safe, portable, adequate, affordable water for the entire community. For regulation number three, uh, in 1988, then Secretary DILG Luis Santos was the first to remind local laws that LWDs are autonomous agencies independent of local government and encourage LGUs and local, local water districts to extend full cooperation in providing sufficient and safe water in areas within their respective jurisdiction. This was echoed by Secretary Barbers in 1997, Secretary Reyes in 2005, Secretary Rojas in 2013, Secretary Sueño in 2016, Secretary Anyo in 2019. If the guiding principles contained in these various circles were followed and observed, many local water districts would have been spared of political intervention in the local level. It would have prevented the conflict arising from misunderstandings between the local government code and presidential decree 198. There are municipal mayor mayors who were perpetually banned from holding public office because of nepotism in the appointment of directors in a local water district. There are also general managers and directors removed from local water districts due to polit political pressure by local officials. Some local chief executives even presupposes that with the power to appoint, the power to unappoint is likewise given to them, which is not congruent with the provisions of PD-198. However, it is true that some water districts are not actually performing well. 
and falls short and wanting in its mandate to provide safe and profitable water supply, much less contribute to the national targets in water supply and sanitation. This could partly be the reason why some local chief executives are not constrained by this memoranda to respect the autonomy and independence of local water districts. They simply cannot just do nothing hearing the complaints of the people. A harmonious relationship, mutual respect, and cooperation between LGUs and local water districts should be paramount. Likewise, understanding the key roles each other play in the development of water supply provision in the local level and the attainment of national goals and objectives should be clearly established. This may very well prove crucial to the effective utilization after more funds are in use post mandanis Perhaps to add power to the context of these circulars, an executive order from the Office of the President is a sound prerogative. Let me share to you that Section 30 of PD-198 says, um, as amended, states that the district can have the power to enter a contract with any person for the purpose of performing any functions of the district, provided that the board of directors may not, by contract, delegate any of the discretionary powers based on the board by PD-198. Discretionary power. That seems to be the key word. It is very clear the board of directors has this inherent power and limitation as spelled out in PD-198. Whereas the, the, the water district, uh, uh, the, the all powers and privileges and duties of the district, district shall be exercised and performed through the board. And likewise, limitations such as the function of the board shall be established policy. The board shall not engage in the detailed management of the district. Now, what are the discretionary powers that the board of directors may not by contract delegate? Can the board delegate by contract the very purpose by for which the water district was created? In Section 5 of PD-198, the local water district may be formed. This is the reason why the water district will be formed. Number one, acquiring, installing, improving, maintaining, and operating water and distribution systems. Let B, providing, maintaining, operating wastewater collection, treatment, and disposal facilities. Let us see conducting such other functions and uh, 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 open water resource development. These questions give rise to arguments about the 2013 NEDA Joint Venture Guidelines for GOCCs, this is, which is backed up by an executive order. Water is covered under these guidelines. Since local water districts are GOCCs, and as opined by OGCC, can enter into a contract for the purpose of performing any of its functions of the district except any of its discretionary power. For some water districts who has entered into a GB contract using the NEDA guidelines, the commission and audit has issued audit findings already unfavorable to the contract entered into with the private partner with recommendations to clarify the conflicts and inconsistencies noted in the provisions of the GDA and PD-198. One COA finding in local water district said that JBS, JBA is prohibited under specific sections of PD-198. And recently, the House of Representatives Committee on, Go on, Go on Government Enterprises and Privatization conducted a series of hearings on the proposed privatization of a local water district, asking to suspend all ongoing proposal for joint venture agreement nationwide and referred the matter to the Committee on Good Governance for further investigation. Well, suffice to say, this development, a review of the 2013 MEDA GB guidelines versus PD-198, I think is in order. With that, I end my comment to the three recommendations at hand. Thank you for the opportunity given for inviting me to this uh, very prestigious public debate. And magandang hapon, mabuhay lang. Maraming salamat din po uh, for your comments, uh, Engineer Carlos Santos. Um, the two discussions uh, presented uh, very important, uh, very interesting uh, uh, comments on on the uh, on the two presentations at this point let me uh, invite our speakers uh 
Dr. Justine Furs, then um, Tester Velasco, to give their brief, brief remarks on the on some of the points raised by the two discussions. Justine, would you like to, to say something? Yes, thank you very much, Sheila. I'd like to thank Ms. De Leon of Lua and Engineer Santos also, uh, formerly resident of Awad and of San Maria Bulacan Water District. Um, I found the, the updates uh, with regard to current policy developments uh, presented by Ms. De Leon earlier, very useful and very aligned with our findings as well. It just affirmed our findings. And I think our findings really just documented, really uh, support to that. Now, uh, I also appreciated her creation, uh, you know, her discussion on the creation of a Department of Water Sources as well as the Water Regulatory Commission. And um, I saw some questions already in the chat box and um, regarding my opinion on this. And first of all, uh, that could be one direction, but I haven't, you know, our city really focused primarily on what the, you know, at the minute details of yes. the, the, the issues of the water sector. So I have not, we have not really explored uh, or studied in detail the proposals with regards to the creation of the Department of Water Sources, Resources and the Water Regulatory Commission. Uh, I think though it is important to be able to, you know, we were able to define what the problems are and the overlaps were. Mm -hmm. And when we suggested that we empower a coordinating committee, uh, mm -hmm. cent a cent centralized uh, investment uh, mm -hmm. strategies, what uh, I said earlier that I'm not pushing for any particular, it could be strengthened um, um, water mandates of the, of the existing water bodies um, or collaboration between the two. Because I saw in the proposal that there would be about eight uh, agencies that would be dissolved in the creation mm -hmm. of the Department of Water Resources and in the Water Regulatory Commission. So I have not, and our study did not cover this. Uh, so that that could be one approach, but I still have yet to study it. Now, there was also a question in the chat box that said that why can't we just create one body and put the regulation under it? It would be ideal that you separate the implementing agency from the regulatory agency. That has always been an issue. You cannot um, credibly regulate if you are an implementer uh, in the same sector. So that's, that's my opinion based on theory. Now, with regard to uh, the comments of of uh, Engineer Santos. I appreciate so much, especially when you talked about the discretionary um, provisions as well as the issues when it comes to the political economy. Another question came up in the chat box earlier regarding um, how can you deal with the political economy issues and so on and so forth. And my response, well, in part of the study, we also documented that the DILG has issued several random circular six. 2013 reissue and reissue to remind the municipal uh, the local chief executive that they should interfere in the operations of the local water district. So that is one of the current efforts at the the, the oversight agency level to be able to try and um, the uh, the local chief executive as the, the the local water district. So so that's all I have to say, and that's that's what I know from there. So maybe Lawrence has something to add about that. Thank you, Sue. Justine. Okay, uh, Professor Velasco, um, any reaction? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you to uh, Ms. Uh, LB and um, GM June on your very insightful uh, suggestions and insights of our paper. I think it brings about two very important view of regulation and the view of an implementer. You know, at the end of the day, water districts are part of uh, water service providers who are really on the ground in implementing projects and helping us the uh, get of universal uh, water access. My reaction primarily is on the implementation side, that's the end of June's part. Um, I think one get here a uh, conflict in of uh, oversight with respect to those uh, joint agreements or PP projects of water districts. So I think that's something that uh, that we all documented in our, uh, in our study, uh, particularly with respect to the nature of these uh, water services. Water service, right? so 
do what districts are by nature, the government owned, and a, um, a joint venture partner, that part is a, is a private sector player. And as I mentioned, part of that part of WRD over power is on private utilities, right? So there is a fine line now, you know, these um, private partners who their power to implement water districts, should they be considered merely agents or should, should they be considered utilities themselves? Because they are the utilities themselves, then obviously the LWRB has uh, mandate over that because they have mandate over all private uh, utilities. But if there are near agents and they will be agents that so has to be defined, you know, uh, then probably who has a, uh, has a uh, I guess, more credible claim of if you can uh, call it that. So that's one example because there's no, there's nothing uh, making sure that these two agencies talk, right? making sure that looking into the respective data or what, no? uh, so walang so, action because um, it's really looking at the two. And they can just butt heads uh, for, for, for and someone has to be You know, it's a type of it. It's, there is a push for reform and uh, by putting these issues out in the, into the open, then that's something that we, uh, that a force that we could uh, record. You know, and, and, and hopefully with that, it's a bit of uh, further reform. Uh, regarding the question on part of water, if you look at our recommendations, it's a, we, we generalize it in such a way that it's only a coordinating body. We have actually decided that is supposed to be in the form of or not because we were wanting to evaluate the current institutional um, uh, situation in all of these agencies. Because for us to be able to say a department is needed, right? So uh, unfortunately, our study were not able to do that because it was just during the pandemic time, it was very difficult to. Uh, or to keep in touch with all of these agencies. But that's something that we can consider, you know, uh, especially on, on making sure that we granularly look at the institutional, you know, and institutional opportunities for all of those agencies that were uh, assumed or, or supposed to be subsumed. You know. And I think there's another question on GIs. Um, yes. Can I answer yes, that, or do you want to ask the yes, question? Yes, actually, you can. You can answer it. You can ask it now. Uh, but but wait. Uh, that that question, by the way, on uh, on on your uh, insights on that the creation of the Department of Water Resources. Let me just say that that question is for Dr. Gilbert Lianto, our former president, mm -hmm. was was also done extensive work on on the water sector, and then. Question on uh, GFIs, no? Uh, would you like to answer it now? I could, I could. Um, uh, yes, part please. Of the uh, mandate of Lua is uh, lending to what we need. Of course, uh, if you look at the lending function, that's usually more uh, parang attached to banks, right? Banks are more, are the usual agencies that you will think of in terms of uh, the lending function. Um, if you look at efficiency, the lending will be turned over to banks, I'd say vertically yes, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the that's the theory of economic, I mean, uh -huh. theories of economics of scale. You know? So if you bind them all together, there should there will be operational efficiency. However, my concern by just simply bundling it, is the problem of this sector is its concerns are lodged in so many agencies that no one is looking at it. No one is put mm -hmm. enough attention. So, for mm -hmm. example, uh, policy, policy leading policy overall, more or less, NEDA is the one uh, leading it, right? Through the Infracom uh, Committee on Subcommittee on Water. But, you know, NEDA a lot of work. They're also in charge of transport. 
social culture, etc. So, wala, so hindi mo, wala ngayon nagpo-focus particularly on issues regarding the sector. So, if and when, if if we will if the proposal is to put a factory bank or our GFI right now, there has to be a structure in place that will allow investment to ensure that those loans previously lodged under LUA will be ensured of this of this right? Uh, at the end of the day, we need the investment to flow. So there has to be a very strong structure on how that is going to be to the intended intended benefits, um, which are uh, well water this on the part of. So that's why the answer is theoretically yes, but there have been times because it could be something with all other functions of a land bank. May mga fund, fund naman yan, land bank and DBP for specific purpose. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 is, it will become one small part of all the solutions of land bank again. So, and, um, there might be uh, right now because we need to do a lot. So, as I mentioned in my presentation, for 2020 to 2023, the master plan says that investment is to 78 billion. No? Uh, we're half and mm -hmm. we don't know if we have reached that amount. No? And so, mm -hmm. um, so focus might be there, no? and probably augmentation on the kind of support we give to work. Okay. Thank you very much, Lawrence. We can enter in other questions uh, during the open open forum, no? because there are still uh, some more Shot box, but uh, uh, just to uh, say that last question answered by your friends on whether lending function currently being uh, uh, carried out by Lua, it should be um, transferred to GFI. Okay, friends, uh, let us uh, give our uh, presenters and discussants a, a, a short break no before they, <laughs> they answer more questions <laughs> so thank you okay <laughs> you're well justine no let's have a poll okay and uh, um um and i hope you have listened intently to the presentation of mr velasco because i am getting the question from there so okay here is our poll question for the week what percentage of has access to pipe household connections. I repeat, pipe household connections. Is it A, 44%, B, 45%, or C, 11%? So please key in your answer now because you have very limited answer. Okay. Okay. And we are now closing the poll, right, Gwen? Okay, the poll has ended, and please uh, give Webex uh, like how many seconds when? 15 back? 15 seconds to process the answer. Okay, so yes, it's more, processing. For our um, uh, web uh, Facebook viewers, feel free to participate in the discussion. Just write your and your uh, question on the comment section of Facebook. Okay, so a. 43 um answer a which is by the way the correct answer you are right 44 percent of has access to a pipe household connections okay so so those answered uh correctly uh we will pick two and First, uh, from uh, those who answered our poll correctly, and each of them will get a PA desk note. I will announce the winners before we close the open forum. Okay, so I think uh, we can now go back to our uh, forum and in more questions. Right? Okay, we have some questions from our chat. We have already answered our two. Uh, uh, presenters have answered the question on the uh, proposed creation of the Department of Water Resources and Water Recognition, and that has been alluded to by our uh, 
discussion from the Lua. And also, we um, they have answered that on the lending function to what uh, to be transferred to GFIs for efficient reasons. There is another question here, and perhaps I can throw this to uh, our uh, discussion from Lua. Patrick James Bezos. Okay. Uh, what can you say about uh, okay the privatization of the operations and maintenance of water districts and municipal water works due to lack of support from the government? So, uh, do you agree to having the operations and maintenance of most of the water districts and municipal water? Works privatized given uh, given um, you know, budgetary constraints faced by the government. May we ask um, our discussion from Dua? De Leon, did you hear yeah. what you're now? Yes, yes. Uh, I think it is possible that the private sector, because they play a they play, play a great role in the uh, water sector provision of uh, increased coverage in the water sector. However, we must have a strong regulatory. Uh, we must have a strong regulatory body. Mm -hmm. So that's it. Okay. To take care of that privatization. Okay, Justine, I saw you nodding your head. Okay, and does it mean that you agree uh, to uh, this uh, suggestion of privatizing uh, uh, some of uh, those uh, mga water districts and municipal works having financial issues? Uh, yes, in principle, we have to tap the sector as much as possible to help to, to attain all of our goals. That's why in the build build program there is there's PP as well. So it's very important, but it also has a strong regulatory uh, structure or framework. And I think uh, the issue with JVA that mentioned by engineer Santos earlier uh, has to address that. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I may um, add uh, on that one. Um, yes, yes. Uh, Lawrence, go ahead. I, I wanted to ask you to because from a finance perspective, again. you know, yes. Go correct, ahead. correct. And <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, privatization has its uh, benefits, you know. And uh, actually, I, I don't want to call it privatization per se because the joint venture guidelines uh, is not actually about privatization per se. No, it's a joint activity on something. You just have to define what that something is, you know, and that's the object of the venture. You know, but, um, I think it's clear in the master plan also that privatization will also play a role according to the plan. Uh, Forty-nine percent of the funding for 2019 to 2023 is actually private in the private sector. So that's around okay. 36.5 billion. So that's so Leza recognizes mm -hmm. that they will play a key role. Now, the issue surrounding regulation will surely inhibit um, participation from the private sector side and also the water district side because water district side will be exposed to um, <clears throat> so, uh, memorandums and all. No? Private sector side, nothing is regulatory this. No, so mm -hmm. fixing the regulatory regime will help both parties and will, 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 will be a strong support towards the attainment also because that was what, what was proposed in our master plan. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Engineer Santos, uh, you're from a district. Uh, what can you say about the proposal, sir? Proposal? Proposal or a suggestion by one of our uh, participants of uh, privatizing uh, uh, privatizing the, uh, the, some water districts and municipal okay. water works. In, in the case of the case of the water district, 
mm-hmm. our charter PD 198 specifically says how water district can be dissolved. There is a specific provision there that says that a water district uh, after mm-hmm. uh, the board of directors has, has uh, uh, filed a dissolution the water district and a competent court has established this real, real reason for the dissolution but another private public entity shall take over there is no privatization as far as pd 198 is concerned mm-hmm. because if you really want to dissolve the water district uh, the pd 198 there is a specific section there uh, uh, I, I don't have time to read right now but it's it has, as i recall it that it, it, it can be dissolved the water district can be dissolved but only a competent court has said that it is right to dissolve it. Secondly, a public entity will take over its operation. No private. So contradicting, mm-hmm. contradicting yung magiging result doon sa PD-199. That's why the, the essence I'm trying to say is, please respect PD-198. It's our charter. That is our Bible. And there are a lot of provisions there that we feel are being over left and right. You know, they are, they, they are saying that this is a law. Of course, it is a law. No, it is a 1970 law. But still, the provisions are there. And that is a law. And it we feel more uh, powerful and it is more, uh, it has the edge of an executive order. So that is our take on that. And if you want to privatize the water district, just like MWSS, another law was passed. You know, to privatize MWSS. And as a result, there is a concession there. They, they were able to create two concessionaires. And of course, there is a concession fee, but the regulatory function was uh, retained to the MW, MWSS regulatory office. You see, and uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what we are saying all along. You simply cannot privatize the water district. You cannot, because you are going to violate a very provision of PD-198. Sir, your, your statements sir, are well noted. Okay. <laughs> yes, actually, Thank I think this is just a suggestion from uh, from one of our uh, participants. Okay. Um, let's uh, uh, go to another question, and I think just answer this, uh, but I, I'd like to get the views of our other speakers, and this is from um, Antonio, Mr. Antonio Dr. Antonio Avila, the national government should concentrate on policy making regulatory function, enhancing of water and sanitation sector, and the role of implementation of water and sanitation services. Uh, what is your reaction to this? Uh, I think I heard the, uh, the reaction of Justine. Um, perhaps I can I can start by Engineer Santos, Muna, and then the other. Sir, the, 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 the reason why it ginawa yung PD-198, the, the reason why it came into law is because uh, the, the local government has failed to, to provide uh, water supply services during the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's take the case of Santa Maria Water District. The first water supply system of Santa Maria was built in, in the 1940s. And it was transferred to the Nawasa. You remember, we all remember the Nawasa, uh, which until now, water districts are called Nawasa. And Nawasak na sila. <laughs> Matagal na silang Nawasak. So anyway, uh, nagkang nagkaroon ng Santa Maria Water Works System, which is operated by the local government system, by the local government unit. Unfortunately, hindi siya nag-progress. So the, the municipality of Santa Maria uh, recognized the need for it uh, uh, another group or another entity uh, to develop the water supply system in the municipality. So ergo, the Santa Maria Water District was born. Mm-hmm. So, yung ibabalik sa LGU, pwede rin yeah, lang, we know, uh, yung sustainability is, is quest, ang ano dun eh, ang issue dun probably eh. Kasi many LGU run water district, as we know it, yung, yung pag-sustain ang mabigat okay. eh. On the first five years, okay yan, kasi brand new system, no problem, uh, operations and maintenance mo, very minimal. But pagka five years, more than five years na yan, and so on, doon na magkakaroon ng mga operational concerns and problems, which, I don't know, 
if there are experts in the local government arm or organization that would see, see to it that uh, the, the, the efficiency of these water supply systems are well kept. Thank you very much, Engineer. Justine, you have been studying local governance issues for quite some time now. So uh, what do you think of this, you know? Yeah, thank you, Tony, for that question. He also personally messaged me. Tony, for listening in. So nice to hear from you. Um, well, that would be my inclination. That's the direction I know the national government is inclined to really uh, this, you know, leaving it up to the local governments to to uh, establish uh, what systems in, in their own particular jurisdiction. So that that's as far as what I know. What the they're still designing the devolution transition plan as we are talking, as well as the over that. So I think, yeah, um, I agree. Um, in in principle, uh, the national government should have more. Oversight, regulatory actions, and you know, coordinating investments. At least starting at the very least. So, so thank you. Although Engineer Santos uh, emphasized in his remarks that you know operating a water system requires a hefty, uh, hefty uh, investments. So imagine, <laughs> yeah, kung kakayanin ba kung Kung, kung LGU, no? Kung LG yung, yung magpo-provide yung uh, hindi po talaga fully yung service ng mga LGUs. Okay. Um, Lawrence, would you like to add to that? Any, any uh, Siguro what I'll just add is uh, if under this, if this proposal will uh, come through, for example, no? I'm not saying I agree fully, no? uh, I think okay. evolution how coordination would be also um, counterproductive. But I mean, I'm not sure whether it's counterproductive. But um, what we're seeing right now, what we're seeing right now, is um, no one is no one is monitoring who is where we are in our goals, right? Mm -hmm. So if you devolve, if you devolve implementation. Fine, they do it, no? If they do it, but someone centrally must be monitoring everyone's performance. Of course, yeah, yeah. Because, and you, you showed that in your study, you know? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. because may, um, they can, we can all devote them and hopefully do their work, mm -hmm. no? But uh, mm -hmm. there has to be uh, some someone in the national or at least regional, I and mean, someone should. Um, make sure that these are also accountable because this is a national target. Right? Mm -hmm. SDG six is a national target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Sheila, if I may add on, yeah, yes, just please. to clarify now and adding on to that, when you say devolve entirely, just to the line, it, it's they take the responsibility to create the local water district. Yeah, yes. it doesn't mean that they, it has to be just LG run. So that's yes. just to clarify my statement. Um, it's really primarily the of the communities and mm -hmm. local governments also um, to do that. And as I mentioned earlier, yeah, um, there, this is a natural monopoly. So there needs, you know, there are huge some costs in investment in this. Yes. So, so the manner by which it, you know, what has been by the national government as well. So thank Right, and, and you think that's something that uh, the proposed uh, uh, regulatory commission? I think this this was in the presentation yata ni ano comments ni uh, ng ating luwa discussant no. He, he mentioned about creating this water reg regulatory commission. Do you think that's something that can solve the problem, or is it done? Um, I mean, I'm I'm afraid to answer that question yeah? because the, the because as of now we saw the overlapping regulatory issues, the water bodies. So I think we have to see that first. And you know, engineers mentioned so, uh -oh. so there has to be something done to align that as well with how it you know how how it yeah. is. I think. Yeah. 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 Ye
And yeah. that's a crushing issue, and we're trying to highlight that this is very urgent, but we also have to be very and very cautious in, you know, recommending the creation of new bodies. Yes. Maybe strengthening the mandate, but... That's a very good point. So, in effect, we're saying that before, before us uh, thinking of creating new bodies, new entities, no? Look first, what are the current overlaps? What are the current gaps? Because as what your study has has uh, shown, no? there are so many regulatory overlaps, many, you know, various investment coordination issues. So, using muna natin to before thinking of creating new new entities. Kasi baka naman pwedeng at that aspect, maayos naman. Instead of, you know, uh, going a step a step further. <laughs> uh, Santos, I think you are raising your hand. Go ahead. Uh, just a thought. See, you, see, you see, there are creating the WRC, you know, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the uh, Water Risk Regulatory Commission, the Department of Water Risk what is best for the country of all this to dealing with this fragmentation will it not be possible for the moment that you know, just keep us the money first because the population is growing. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the expectations for local water districts as one of the service providers in the country is getting high. I mean, in the, in the, the sanitation program, you know how much do we need? Santa Maria Palang? About 60 to 70 million pesos. So where are we going together? We ask Lua and then Pops Obus Nami eh, next 2023 kana. Uh -oh. so, and, I and I suppose that? engineer the pan the pandemic has multiplied your your water and sanitation yes. needs, no? Yes, talaga sobra. Kaya nga sa alik sinasabi sa mga go ahead to it's gonna be must be right away. So that we can we can deliver what we are mandated to do. Para something like that. Kasi, Ang dami na pinag-uusapan talaga eh. Yung, yung department of Parliament. Para yata ako. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, much sir, engineer. Miss, uh, Miss De Leon, uh, would you have any response to that? Uh, in respond to GM Santos, uh -oh. uh, Lua never stopped naman of securing funds for the water supply and as well as the sanitation. But we observe also na, uh, the inclination of the department uh, DPM is towards the provision of a budget for sanitation, particularly the Manila Bay Mandamus. Just this, uh, uh, I think for the uh, last two years, we never received money for water supply. So it's uh, an issue. Another issue that, uh, another challenge that we are facing with the financing of this water supply. And uh, there is also an issue of uh, maybe slow disbursement, mm -hmm. uh, low utilization of funds. So, uh, department, uh, and they have uh, the department, the DBM. Uh, this serves as the basis of DBM in giving us the funds. So we need really to utilize the funds that's available with us. Maybe that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, no funds for the water supply for the meantime. So that's an issue mm -hmm. in Lua. Okay. So, Thank you very much, um, Ms. Delegon. Okay, we have um, an in, uh, an interesting uh, comment from uh, Roberto Cabardo. And it's uh, it's recommending a uh, creation of a strong type type group consisting of the government districts and consumer group. Um, this is this is to make sure that the interests the interests of public service 
considered. Uh, would you have any suggestion? I think this is a very good idea, but perhaps this is already in existence. System. I'm not sure. Uh, baka mas, uh, ni, ni Lawrence, this study, meron bang tripartite group na nag exist Yeah, thanks for that question, Sheila. But I'm going to throw it Lawrence and to the those who are in the, the sector, I think they would um, know, know, yeah, more yes. about this. Thank um, you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, Lawrence? I'm not aware whether there are organized ones. Mm -hmm. no, I'm, what I'm sure is that uh, public consultation part of the great setting process of okay. and also WN. So, um, Surely the consumer group may be involved in the way, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I am aware whether there are um, more higher level, I guess, um, um, coordination or, or collaboration currently, no? but definitely um, I think that the objective at the end of the day is consumer protection. So, yes. Yes. Uh, that's something that regulators the many regulators of the sector should be able to assimilate in their uh, in their rate, rate review process. No, not, mm -hmm. not just rate review, but making sure that quality of service is maintained. Part of mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. regulator. That's no? right. Making sure that the output is up to up to to the expectations of the consumers. Thank you very much, Professor Lapa. Engineer Santos, any questions? Um, uh, are you I aware of any? Yes, uh, go ahead. I, I, don't, I don't know where part of your insight nung nagtong, but uh, siguro ang, ang thinking niya, I don't know no, kung tama ito, ay ang water district kasi is hindi siya profit-oriented. Mm -hmm. A water district is always has been a service oriented, service -oriented. government owned and mm -hmm. government owned and controlled corporation. So we don't care about uh, revenues per se. Uh, everything that we earn as per our date, we, we put it back to improvements and expansion and everything. Probably this is the idea that comes into his mind. Na, na kaya kailangan government ang naga handle ng uh, mm -hmm. basic services such as water supply. Kasi dapat siya siguro, iniisip niya, probably hindi siya dapat uh, pagkakitaan. Baka lang gano'n ang concept. I don't know if I'm wrong or tama ba yung sagot ko sa kanya. But that's how I see it as far as, 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 as a general, general for water uh, Kasi if you, if you, if a private company operates a water system, definitely uh, may, may VAT na yan may value-added tax, uh, magbabayad na ng income tax yan, at uh, pangatlo, of course, yung revenue siya ni property ng stockholders or stakeholders nila. So it's entirely different as far as water district for the what, vision of water supply by the water district is concerned. Thank you, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Engineer Santos. Uh, let me just go back to our chat questions. This is one of the first questions that a while um, at the end of the uh, forum. This is from Adrian Agbon. Is the estimate of how much spent on Earth? And two, aside from access, uh, is there a mandate from NUWA and NWRB about quality water being delivered to those households connected to TAP? I, su I suppose those are parts uh, ensuring uh, the quality of water Demanded, of course, because they are regulators. Mm. But okay. Yeah. Um, quality. Yes, please. Uh, on quality, of course, uh, that's part of water quality is part of the key performance indicators of Lua and, and WRB. They have to comply with the Department of Health standards and things. So, nakalist on ano characteristics ng to be part of indicators because we have access to do anything with it because it's murky or uh, malabo or so definitely quality is part of that and 
absolutely and talagang dapat naman it's part of the uh, 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 quality or key performance indicators for UA and NWR. Okay, thank you very much, Lawrence. How about the first uh, question, just uh, did you do you have any data on this? As to how much for spend on water? Uh, Hi, the percentage of their income. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Sheila. No, we didn't look into this. Uh, into this detail, we were really looking into more of the sector. Um, yeah. And based on the information that we got from the leads and uh, too big as well. So that's where we, we focused on. So we do not have this information. Thank you. Although it's important, uh, another angle to this, this particular issue. Thank you. Boy, that's I think. <laughs> and I think you have also answered uh, how do we ensure from being politicized. I think you mentioned a, a circular from the DILG, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, we're down to our last two questions. Sorry, there are still more questions in the chat. But then, um, okay, let me. Um, okay, one. Um, I think this is um, a follow up question by Ito Minister Avila. Uh, to implement the plans, what should the government do to transfer additional to LGUs? Should the national government stop providing assistance to LGUs in the GAA? Would you favor the 30 billion additional amount to be distributed to LGUs in accordance with the present era? Or would you recommend this amount be distributed to organization? I think you covered this in your presentation just yes. this will be uh, the national program and are considered to have organization uh, fund targeting the objective criteria selecting LG should be clear. Tama? Clear. Yes, Same exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for that for that question. I'd like to answer just the one on the era. Please. He said, yes, yes, yes. He said, should it be distributed uh, according to the current era formula? Well, I think that is what it that's what will be happening. Uh, as of the moment, because that's already next year, and we're already in the 2022 budget, and I'm not sure that we will be able to change the era for um, So, um, in response to your, would should it rather be a fiscal equalization grant? I think that it really would. The national government oversight agencies will be giving it directly to LGU, um, and then decide how to create uh, a fiscal equalization grant. And I think I get what you're saying that the distribution using the current era formula may not be equitable. So you're trying to figure out how to make it equitable. Perhaps the way we can try to do it if we cannot yet touch the era formula, be um equalization and in rather than distribution. Thank you, Tony. Uh, we can talk offline more about that. Thanks. Thank you very much, Justine. There's another question from Joseph. So, Joseph, um, this has been answered already on uh, the management of local water districts uh, uh, vested in local government units. Kanina na ito ni ano, the professor. Our last question, sorry. Um, sorry, kasi yung questions na, 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 na answer na naman po. So, is there any way right now prioritize water supply allocation for drinking water over that with irrigation? I think this is a contentious issue. Po. There are also needs that the to be met, okay, uh, ng agricultural sector. So I think it's not an either or. So both, need, both uh, needs need to be met, okay, agriculture for uh, drinking for both. Just like I see that in your head, <laughs> Sheila, you got that that answer right on. Uh, there are many urgent, you know, needs, and it's not either or. It's just prioritize, yes. I guess, what the next step would be. What's the concern? So, the agriculture sector as well is a top priority of the current administration to propel economic growth. 
there are so many needs that have to prioritize. So thank you. Yes, and with that, we now close our open forum. Uh, please join me in thanking our uh, speakers, Dr. Justin Sikat and uh, Professor Lawrence Velasco, as well as for discussions, uh, Ms. Elvira De Leon of Lua and Engineer Carlos Santos of the Santa Maria Water District for the valuable insights that they have shared with us this afternoon. So let us give them a big virtual clap. Okay. And thanks to all to all our participants who participated in the open forum. Maraming salamat po. Friends, we hope that our webinar today has brought to the attention of our business and agency and the public and private providers, the governance issues on the delivery of essential services at the local level. One key fact that we heard is the underutilization of development fund by the LGUs. Um, this is uh, quite alarming. This LGUs continued reliance on national government to deliver services that they themselves should be financing from their, uh, their LGUs means that resources that the government could use for social protection, education and other services are directed to LGUs instead. When the ruling takes effect in 2022, there should be stricter monitoring by the concerned agency of the utilization of the LGU to ensure that this practice does not persist. And as uh, the decision, discontinue this national government support programs for LGUs and create a fiscalization grant objective criteria and targeting LGUs be clear. Another fact that we heard pertains to the issues of regulatory overlaps and investment coordination in water sector, as uh, Professor Velasco. This issue affect the objective of universal coverage of water service, as well as quality and efficiency of service provision. As we continue to fight this, let us bear in mind that clean, reliable, and affordable water management service is among our first line of defense against COVID-19, as water and sanitation play a critical and catalytic role in mitigating the pandemic's impact on people and the environment. Okay, so before we close, I can finish for this. Okay, let me check uh, who are the winners. Okay, the winners are Shi Ross Ang and Ryan Twain. And Ryan Fantes, you want and our call of today. Our winner will get in touch with you for the surprise. And finally, friends, we have some reminders. Okay. Um, flash on the screen are the links to the uh, presentations. You can um, download them from our seminar page and also the discussion papers and the policy notes written by uh, um, Dr. Uh, Sikat and Professor Velasco and their assistants. Okay, next slide. Please help us improve our webinars by answering our survey. Uh, flash on the screen is the link, but as well, uh, um, we will email you uh, the survey form. And next slide. And uh, okay. Regularly visit our website and our follow us on our social media pages. Maraming salamat sa lahat. Dito sa amin, sa aming Twitter account, sa aming Facebook account, PIDS Facebook account, and also on the SERPI Facebook account. And we have one more seminar uh, for April. So on April 29, that's next week, we will talk about uh, the country's expanded immunization program. Very timely topic. And we'll also talk about our primary health care for non-communicable diseases. And of course, we would like to thank um, representatives from uh, different government agencies, the private sector, academe, civil society, and also from the media who uh, participated in our webinar this afternoon. Maraming salamat po. And friends, this concludes our webinar for this week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. See you next week. And thank thanks you. again to all our speakers.
in our discussions. Yeah. Maraming salamat po. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Engineer Zuan, Ms. De Leon. Thank, thank you, Engineer. Thank you, Ms. De Leon. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, Pulitin po, sir. And ma'am. Just let me know. Uh, thanks okay. po. Thank you. Salamat. Salamat. Thank you, Ms. Elvira. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tashida. Be safe, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Elvira. Salamat po. Salamat din. Salamat din.